All right. Enough is enough. I mean, it's not enough is enough. It's that I always, for 40 years, have been an advocate for the dialogue between blacks and Jews. Why? Because of my experience. And I'll begin with the beginning. When I was a child, I was in the hood, and it was by all accounts a ghetto. I mean, we were underserved community. We were all black. We were uh, mostly in poverty. But I was bused to a school, a white school, in a white neighborhood. Archie Bunker's neighborhood, because from Queens, over there was Archie Bunker's neighborhood. And I would go there in public school, um, and they would chase me. The Green Ways, the Irish gang, would chase me. And, I, and the only place I could go was in this community, this little co-op buildings, co-op buildings. And these co-op buildings, I didn't know until later, were Jewish. Me. So there was my first experience with Jews. I didn't know they were Jews. They were white, all white to me, right? But they were Jews. They were my first experience where I, Billy Lampett and Richard, so these kids, their families protected me. All right, flash forward, I get uh, adult and I get in the record business and I, you know, I meet Rick Rubin and Leo Cohen and they're my first partners in music and they were very, very good partners. They did their job, I did mine. And during that time, I was growing as a manager. We had so many bands. I represented so many bands. From the Beastie Boys and LL Cool J, and Public Enemy and Slick Rick, so we were the managers. And I would go, my friend Jeff Wald, who was a mentor of mine, Jewish guy, just died, one of my best friends throughout my entire adult life. I went to his, his wedding, he married this African-American woman, Deborah, who I adore, and his daughter, Sarah, is my family. He married Helen Reddy. Okay, so Jeff Wall, my dear friend who just died, took me on vacation to the Kawala Hilton in, in um, Hawaii. And all the senior executives and chairmen of the music companies were there. Now here I am, a young black man at the Kahala Hilton, everybody there is Jewish. The entire community there is Jewish. And everybody there is way more successful than me. So I'm running around sucking up the knowledge. Like I'm learning the game. I'm, I'm sucking up game. And I became friends with all of The only person who came once that wasn't Jewish was Tommy Matola, but he never came back. But all of them, the Seymour Stein, whoever they were that were chairman, I was their friend. And I was a person they would look to kind of help a little bit. And they helped me uh, later on. I might tell that story, but probably don't have time with the public enemy problem. I went right there and tried to fix the fight between public enemy and some of the members of the Jewish community. But they empowered me and I learned a lot, you know, and Jeff Wall was my supporter. And all the chairmen of the music industry were Jews. Uh, but you had a flashback before that, that all the first artists who became pop and who got on the radio and everything else were promoted by Jews. So the Jews did what the Wasp didn't want to do in that case. In the music industry, they were the ones who, I mean, of course, there was some exploitation, but then who wouldn't exploit an opportunity when no one would help you but the one guy? So the one Jew would say, I'm going to do this, and some of the deals were very fair, some were not so fair, but they were the only game in town. The Jews helped empower blacks early on in music. But for me, they empowered me and eventually I got a record deal and we had great success. Next was fashion. There was no such thing as black people in the fashion business at all, at all. And then I ended up with 75 license, more, 75 at least licenses. The bags, the belts, the underwear, the wallets, the leather goods didn't include the belts, the belts were separate. The lingerie, the jeans, the leather coats and the hoodies uh, separate. And then the, the bomber coats, separate. All, so all these separate businesses were my partners in licensing fat farm. And they were all from one community, no not all, but most from one community, the Syrian Jewish community. And so I was partners with all these Syrian Jews and no wasps. There were wasps in the fashion business as you might imagine, but none of them were my partner. So I had all these Jews and they put me in the business. I put Jay-Z in business with some Russian Jews at very versus the Syrians, but I put him in business. I put Nelly in business with a Syrian Jew, uh, Ruby Azrak, and he and them, they made $100 million one year. They must be 
have done 500 million in gross. Huge company. It was called, um, what the fuck was Nelly's clothing company called? Um, uh, rock away, rock away. Whatever, I'll come to it later. But Nelly had, as you remember, Apple Bottom, right? So Rockefeller, Apple, I put them all in business with Jews who helped them to become very successful. They owned their company, the Jews distributed and manufactured for them. Um, as did I, or own Fat Farm and Jews distributed and manufactured for me. So that was my, and then one time I can tell you a great story how all the built buildings, every building on 125th Street, owned by Jews, all by Syrian Jews too, so it's kind of interesting. The little, comp, little families in Ocean Parkway owned all the real estate. Why did they own the real estate? Because blacks couldn't afford it and wasps didn't want to own it. Similar to when I was a kid and the, the Jews owned some of the candy stores and the grocery stores. So why did Jews in our business? Because the wasps didn't want to be and the blacks couldn't afford it again. So from a business standpoint, we should see them. They got their hands dirty. Even in banking, they got their hands dirty. Money was dirty. So why are the Jews so close to us? They're in businesses that we are in businesses that the WASP didn't like or didn't want, and then they ended up being the number one empowerment group for us in those businesses. I was gonna tell you about the buildings on 125th Street. 125th Street, every building was owned by a Syrian Jew, everything. So the Dr. J's and Jimmy J's and s and and all the clothing stores, because that was the fashion revolution. And there were so many fashion brands and so much black uh, fashion and black uh, distribution of ideas, but they were all through Syrian Jews retail. So one guy says, uh, a Syrian tells me, yo, let's, let's buy this building. How much? I don't know. I didn't do it, but I could have. He said, we're gonna, what are we going to do with it? We're going to call it black owned. But your cousin lives next door. Your cousin owns the store, our competitor next door. If, you, if we buy the building, we'll be competing with your cousin. It's just business. But he wanted to yell black owned from that. That was a fact. We wanted to have a black owned store in the midst of all the Syrian owned stores. And we would have used race as a race card because, of course, 125th Street, it should be black owned. And he recognized that and tried to engage me in that process. But it was fashion. And then in jewelry, I had Scott Roush. And Scott Roush, I was the only black guy at the jewelry convention. I used to notice, damn, very few black designers. And we had a big distribution with Zales and other stores. And then I went to Africa with Scott. We did the Diamond Empowerment Fund. And a bunch of Jews wrote $8 million worth of checks for, this, for the... Uh, um, uh, school we built, uh, which was called the Cedar Institute in South Africa, and also for what now is a very famous school. We, we founded it with our money, money I got from the Jews. But they're not, I got it from them, the Oppenheimer family. We funded what's called the African Leadership Academy. Obama, everybody visits there now, but we started it. So, empowerment. White people are not all the same, right? Jews are different. Jews are afraid they've been discriminated against. Jews uh, have other qualities that kind of helped us in how many businesses? Beginning in civil rights, the Jews were there for us more than the other whites. I'm not saying they died with us, for us, they were slaves. No, I'm saying that they were there for us when the whites, other whites weren't. So I just don't like a misinformation. I just want to share my experience because not only film, and I was the first, I was one of the first blacks. Name, my name was on Nutty Professor as producer. I didn't ride a go-kart. I wasn't an actor. I wasn't, you know, necessary. But I was a producer. I rode the go-kart around on the set on Nutty Professor. And how did I get to become the first, if not the very first, black producer of a $70 million movie that was, you know, not considered a black movie? I did that partnership with a Jew. So, you know... What, what Minister Farrakhan likes to say, look at them, look how they empower each other. Look how, t of course they're gonna be angry you fuck with Israel. That's one of their favorite pet peeves. And of course, if you threaten their, their, their safety after having been through what they've been through, then of course they will be like pit bulls. I mean, I say they, I don't mean the collective, I mean parts of the collective, right? Because they don't mean everybody. When I say the Jews, I don't mean every Jew. Many Jews don't care about Israel, but most, a great number do. And so if you attack Israel, they'll say you're attacking them, and maybe that's misinformation too, but because you could love the Jews and not like Israel's policy. But all of these things 
it's, it's not so complex. The Jews are where the wasp let them be. They, didn't, they, they, don't, they don't control everything. They control what wasp let them control. And that's really our experience and reality. And what they let them control, whether it's parts of the music business, parts of the film business, well, the film business, Jews were there. And, you know, largely, we have made great gains lately. And, of course, no one is there to advocate only for the black community or for the black community. But we've made good gains. Um, but I do say that I have nothing but experiences of empowerment in film, television, fashion. Oh, Rush Card, 51% owned by a black, 50.1% owned by a black man. It was a black bank, a black empowerment bank that underwrote the Million Family March. Um, my partner is David Rosenberg, my lifelong friend and partner, another Jew, who's still my lifelong friend and partner. So, you know, if we talk about our oppressors, well, we talk about, let's get a little further than what's in front of us, and let's see the bigger picture. Let's not gla blame any group, but blame a mentality and infrastructure. Let's blame uh, things that we can work to change. Attacking individuals uh, or communities may not be our way out. I've been the chairman of the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding for 25 years before I, was, uh, I, I stepped down after being scandalized. And what I did was bring people together. Uh, and this, this blog and this statement I'm making is meant to bring people together, to look to empower each other, and to, um, to really look deeper into who we are blaming for our current situation. And can we not blame, but be like the Jewish community and come together and empower each other. That's really the mission of this blog, to empower each other and to borrow and learn from the lessons. The Jewish community, they were lucky enough to have culture and religion and a, a lot of similar qualities that bonded them together, including torture, including oppression. But they were lucky enough to have a culture. They weren't robbed of their names, their culture, their religion, their God. They weren't robbed of these things. So at least they had that. And this is how they survived. So when they feel threatened, I mean, even the collective, when the group feels threatened, yes, they will exude whatever power they can to protect themselves in their future. But it's best don't attack them because they've done what anybody would do, what any community should do. They've empowered each other. And they've also showed enough compassion and support to empower all of our civil rights initiatives. Um, and that's, you know, the NAACP is funded by Jews, was in the beginning. And, you know, and they got in quite a bit of trouble. Many Jews died in the civil rights marches and movement. Um, they were there when the wasps weren't and aren't. So it's not to attack Kanye. This is just what he can see versus what I saw. And this is just my factual experience. It's not to attack anybody. This is to give you another perspective on uh, whatever they may refer to as the Jewish problem. The problem is we don't act like them. The problem is we don't empower each other the way we could. And I hope that everybody learns something from this experience. There are more experiences beside fashion and film and records and TV and film and financial services and jewelry. There's more lessons than that. But those are my lessons in jewelry, Scott Roush, in fashion, Nate Kestenbaum and Ruby Azrak and the entire Syrian community and 70 other partners in, I can go on and on. These were my partners and they empowered me and I did nothing but try to empower others. And the rest of my life will continue to be an effort to empower more people more often. Namaste, Yogi. Thank you for listening.